Good morning, everybody. Welcome into worship. We're going to start by singing about unity. This is called We Are One in the Spirit. we ask for you to um, move among us, unify our hearts, reminding us of our deep connectedness in you. God, root us squarely in the center of who you are, in the center of your dream for the world. Help us to see clearly the love that is between us and how we can share in your love to make the world more in line with your vision for us as human beings. Amen. Three-point Bulldog lead, 62-59, with 4.40 to go here in Nashville. Now you got Foster down low, setting back screen. He pops out top, takes the open three. Good again! 73-68, got to go fast. Shane, from 30 feet, Shane, hit it! Timeout! 20 seconds to go. 18 seconds, Foster off the screen, gets another one. Pulls up from three-point range. Good! Oh, my gosh! Rhodes guarding him, so they run the back door. Elliot slam Shane Foster. He's got 36. 84-80. 32 seconds to go. Shane Foster, long three, nailed it. Timeout. Oh, my goodness. Seven, six, five. Up top, Foster, four. Shane for three. Go! Launches it at the buzzer. It's so good. It's so good. The Vanderbilt Commodores have rallied to beat Mississippi State. 86, 85. Oh, oh. There's no words to describe what he just did in the second half in the overtime. Shane Foster, 42 points. I tell you, I, if if you did not see this game tonight, then you missed something because this that may special. have been one of the most special performances by a Vanderbilt athlete that I think any of these Vanderbilt fans have probably ever seen. Good morning, Woodmont, and welcome to worship. Our scripture this morning, we actually have two. Uh, the first comes from Romans chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And our second passage comes from Galatians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 27. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Would you say a short prayer with me? Loving God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We continue our morality series today, and I am joined by a very special person. And if you're a Vanderbilt fan, then you recognize uh, this person, uh, Shane Foster. Uh, Shane is the all-time uh, point uh, scoring leader at Vanderbilt, the all-time three-point leader. He was an All-American. Uh, he was drafted by the Dallas Mavericks, and uh, it is an absolute honor uh, to have Shane here today. Uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome to Woodmont, and thank you for, uh, for being with us and, uh, and, and doing this dialogue with me. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here, excited to share. Uh, this is my first time here, and, and so I'm, I'm certainly uh, loving the opportunity to be able to, to be here in the fellowship with you all. Shane is, uh, wears many hats, but uh, he is also um, the executive director of the AMEND program at the YWCA, not too far from here. Uh, he's been there five years, and he's the author of a brand new book, uh, that I'm holding up. It is called What Hurt Didn't Hinder, and it just came out, and, um, and I, I read it this week. It is a phenomenal memoir of his life, and there are so many uh, valuable lessons uh, in this book, and we're going to talk about uh, some of those this morning. But Shane, uh, you and I have gotten to know each other over the past year, and you said something last year in 2020 that uh, really stuck with me. In fact, I've used it in sermons and uh, and uh, articles, but you said in 2020, we faced a perfect storm, all of us, as COVID, uh, political tension, racial tension. You said we faced this perfect storm, but we're all going through it in, and we're in different boats. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, I think first and foremost, it's, it's really about understanding that while we're all going through the same struggles, we're all experiencing the same thing as it relates to COVID-19, we're all in the same community that is raving with domestic violence, mental health is a huge issue right now, and regardless of economic status, everybody's dealing with that mental health piece, uh, trying to find different ways to cope with stress in very different ways. Um, we all have different access points to, to health care, to resources, to opportunities. Um, even from a, a, a job and professional standpoint, many have been laid off. Um, so many have lost their jobs and lost their ability to provide for their families and, and have uh, the ability to safely social distance. Being able to social distance is also a, a bit of a privilege now um, due to you know what kind of boat you're in. And so it's important to understand that as, as we deal with this, as we um, use our own mechanisms and, and, and really glean to our families and our friends and, and lean on the support that we have to, to get through and to overcome this perfect storm that we're in, it's important to understand what boat is my neighbor in? What boat are my other brothers and sisters in? Being that we are all one in Christ, it's important because if we don't know what boat our, our brothers and sisters are in, how can we adequately help? All too often we see individuals from a philanthropic standpoint who are giving resources to different organizations and, and, and doing different things, oftentimes not stopping to ask, what do you need, right? Like if, if, if I'm hungry, you, you giving me, you know, some, some, some money might not help especially in the event that I don't have a vehicle in order to get to somewhere to get, a, get some food, right? If, 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 if I'm in a situation where my lights are getting ready to turn, be turned off, you giving me food is not going to help me, mm -hmm. right? So we got to stop and really appreciate um, that 
all of us are in very different boats and it's important to stop and consider what specific boats those are so that we can lend a hand and meet the need as opposed to feeding our own ego in some cases in terms of our philanthropic efforts. But it goes even deeper than that. How can we truly be friends? How can we truly be one if we don't know each other? So much of the problem right now is that we're so disconnected. Right? If it wasn't for the internet, think about where we would be in terms mm. of our interactions with each other. It's scary to think right? about. It's scary to even think about that. Yeah. So it's important to consider what boat is my brother in? What boat is my sister in? And, and, and how can I serve? Right? We talk about Christ and what he was able to do while he worked, walked the earth. He served. He came to serve. The all-powerful, the almighty, the all-knowing. He came to serve. And he's called every single one of us who are believers to serve. But we can't serve if we don't know what boat our brothers and sisters are in. Well, in the book, you talk about your faith and how the Christian faith and the church played such a huge role in your upbringing uh, in Louisiana and Mississippi when you lived there. Um, so what role has your faith played throughout your life and how, what role does it continue to play? Because clearly it's a big part of what drives you. Well, you know, one of my favorite scriptures is, is Ephesians 3 and 20. It says, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. One of the reasons why that's my favorite scripture is just because it's empowering. It reminds me that, the, that God has already given me all that I need to overcome whatever situation I'm in. Right? He's, already, he's already worked it out. He's already working through me. He's already uh, brought about the solutions that, that I'm looking for in many cases. I grew up in a household that was in church every single day. If, there, if the doors of the church were open for, for maintenance, I was there. Right? My uncle was the pastor. Uh, my, my grandmother uh, was a missionary. My grandfather, who I grew up with, was, was a deacon in the church. So we, we were there all the time. Um, as a consequence of being there all the time, you, you pick up on some things. You learn some things, right? And, and I was able to learn the importance of not only faith, but a, but a genuine personal relationship with God. Right? where I'm not leaning on the experiences of others and the stories of others, but I've had a unique encounter and experience with God for myself. That, he, that as the Bible says, he walks with me, he talks with me, right? And as the song says by, um, by so many great art, artists, that he calls me his own that I'm, I'm, I'm not a nomad, I'm not, I'm not out here running the streets aimlessly without, without leadership, without guidance, without love, that God loves me and I'm able to experience that love on a regular basis. But most importantly, that love, that grace, right? That oozes out of me because of my relationship with Christ that because I'm constantly walking with him, we, we've all heard phrases that talk about, you know, you are the, 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 the summation of the company you keep. Well, if my company is Jesus Christ, then that should be oozing out of me. It should be oozing out of every single thing that I do, including my interactions with people and those who don't look like me, right? So, it's, it, so that's where my faith really impacts the work that I do now and the work I've done all over the world, right? Is that everything that I do is really the summation of my relationship with Christ. So when the first time Shane and I had lunch, uh, I actually asked him, I said, have you ever thought about being a preacher? Uh, Cause you'd really be a, you'd really be a good preacher. And, uh, and I think, you know, what he does is a form of ministry and he gets to preach and speak all over, all over the country. Um, you talk in the book about your upbringing and you grew up uh, in, a, in, a, in a poor family. Uh, you had some significant challenges in your childhood. You're actually the the victim of domestic abuse uh, that you talk about in the book. And I think that's a lot of what is inspiring the work that you're now doing at the YWCA. Uh, how did your childhood and your upbringing, um, how, did you, how did that form you? How did those challenges mold you into the person that you are today? Well, I think one of the things we talk about in the book is, is the difference between the first six years of my life and the next six years of my life, mm -hmm. right? And in those first six years, I saw a model of Christ's love for us and what love should look like. When I looked at the relationship that my grandmother and my grandfather had, spending those first six years with them, 
I, I saw what chivalry looks like. I saw what 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 compassion looks like. I, I saw what what grace looks like in a relationship. I saw what forgiveness looks like, right? All of these things that were incredible, how, how they just adored each other every second of every day. The next six years of my life, I saw a lot of abuse. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of, of yelling and screaming and demeaning of, of, the, of the other person. I, I also experienced child abuse, uh, which I talk about in the book. And, and all of those things really showed me what not to do very up close and personal. And not only did I see what not to do, I saw the negative effects, the trauma, that it, 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 it weighs on the person who is the victim of that kind of abuse. Oftentimes we don't talk about it enough, but I'm not the only one who has a story of having gone through and experienced that and, and, and witnessed that uh, and, and not been able to talk about it. Because it's far too often we, we've heard phrases that say what happens in our house stays in our house. So we're not talking about the experiences that we've had. We're not talking about the things that we've seen, which means on, over a long period of time, that's going to have a detrimental effect on the relationships that you get in even as an adult. So a part of my healing process has been to begin talking about these things, to be vulnerable and to share how I felt in those moments and to share how I was able to overcome. And a lot of my over coming that was leaning on my faith, really spending a lot of time talking to God. I spent a, a two entire summers just reading the whole Bible and deep in prayer. Um, but I also had, had basketball that I was able to turn to as an outlet to get away from all of that. And while everyone was cheering and I was scoring a lot of points and dunking on people, nobody knew that that was my outlet to get away. Nobody knew that my motivation for going so hard on the basketball court was so that I can get away from that dysfunction and that trauma, right? Nobody knew that I was secretly on the inside really yearning for a place to belong because I felt like I didn't belong where I was at home. And I was living two different lives, trying to be the man my grandparents taught me to be, trying to be the man who, who figures out manhood and masculinity as a, as a teenage boy living in a household where there was abuse, right? And so all of these things weren't separate from me from me when I was playing ball but ball gave me a chance to really get away from that and my faith is what carried me through it when you talk about how hard you had to work uh, in middle school high school to get better and better at basketball and then you were uh, you know recruited to come play at Vanderbilt and you picked Vanderbilt you said not just because of basketball gave you the chance to play in the SEC but also because you're able to get a world-class education uh, that would that would be the foundation, you know, for life. But along the way, you've experienced some uh, some disappointments. Um, you talk about how you know you were drafted in the second round by the Dallas Mavericks, um, but the dream of actually you know being on the roster and playing in the U.S. Uh, you know it never worked out like you thought. You had to play in, in Europe, and you had some great experiences over there. But there was a dis disappointment of that. Uh, you got some health news, I think, when you went to Phoenix uh, that, that didn't allow you to play. Uh, um, and you also had a relationship uh, that didn't work out. And so how have you, you know, how did you persevere later in your life uh, in the face of those disappointments to, to keep going when things that you thought would work out a certain way didn't? Well, I, I think it, it really falls back on my faith because, you know, I truly believe that God's plan for our lives oftentimes is more important than our plan. And oftentimes it's actually more beneficial to, to not only yourself, but to the community and to others when God's plan becomes first, right? I, I've heard a lot of people say, you tell God your plans and he'll laugh, right? Because at the end of the day, as the Bible says, it's only what we do for him that will last. All this other stuff we're doing is, is, is a formality. At the end of the day, we're here to, to, as Jesus said, be about our father's business, right? And so basketball was, was what I was doing. And as I went through my entire life and, and, and went through those challenges that you named, I started to become more intimate with who I am. And who I am is not only a follower of Christ, but one who deeply, deeply cares about other people and my life is one that has not been for me and what I was going to accomplish. It's been for others. As I share my story in this book, I realized that it wasn't about getting to the top of my mountain. It was about the climb. It was about the lessons that I would learn. 
having to, to go through adversity and having to overcome that adversity, leaning on my faith when I didn't feel like I had others who could help or who I could talk to or turn to in those situations where I had to literally end up on my knees because I was depressed. A guy who had all the accolades, who everybody was clapping for and supporting and everybody loved, but internally I was going through depression. I didn't know who I was. I was having an identity crisis. And I had to remember that my identity is not based in what the world says. My identity is based in Christ, that I, I am because he is, right? And that he ultimately affirms me. And so when I go through those challenges, being drafted in the second round, I'm, I'm grateful to have been drafted. Not, not, there's not a whole lot of people that get drafted That's into right. the NBA. I accomplished that dream. I wanted more out of that. But God said, I'm going to use this platform and this experience to be able to, to give hope to people who have experienced domestic violence, to be able to spread the message that this is something that we can talk about and that I can heal people in this regard. That, 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 that now, because of what you've accomplished on the basketball court, people are gonna listen when you say that there's a such thing as toxic masculinity and that we're literally not living out our full potential as men and boys because we've, we've subscribed to a version of manhood that is very limiting and in a lot of ways not godly not exuding that love, um, that grace, that forgiveness, mm -hmm. right? That humble spirit that comes with being a follower of Christ, right? And you talked about it in, in, in the scripture, right? And so all of these things really help me to get through those challenges and to re be able to regain confidence in myself, right? So, because when you go through identity crisis, I played ball my whole life. I right. wanted to play basketball. I didn't want to do anything else. But God says, my plan is much greater for you than anything that you can imagine. So going back to my favorite scripture, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. I never asked him for this. I never thought about doing what I'm doing now. But what I'm doing now is far greater and making far more of an impact than anything I ever accomplished on the basketball court. Oh, that's great. Um, I want to, tomorrow's MLK Day, we celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. And, um, and tomorrow's the holiday. Um, this is a man who gave his life to speak out against racism, racial injustice, ultimately lost his life because of it. How did Dr. King uh, inspire you? And how does he continue to inspire you? And then you've, in the book, you know, you do talk about race and, and, um, and how just challenging it is that we just slowly continue to make progress, but we've got to do more. But can you talk about the, the, the Dr. King and, and his inspiration in your life? Well, Dr. King really set the gold standard for how to go about advocacy, how to go about civil rights, how, how to be allies, how to, um, really do this work as brothers and sisters. When he talked about, I have a dream that, that little white boys and little uh, white girls will walk hand in hand with little black boys and little black girls, reuniting us with the scripture that says we who are baptized in Christ are one that we're not segregated, that we're not, we're, we're not distanced from each other. That, 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 that my success depends on your success. My, my safety depends on your safety. That, that we're all in this together. And, and to advocate for that in a way that is exuding that love, that grace, that humbleness, right? That faithfulness, being faithful to the cause, being faithful to the ministry. Right. The Bible talks about we have this ministry. Right. This is this is our work together. Right. Right. And, and, and so when I think about the way in which Dr. King lived his life, did his ministry and advocated, that's the way in which I try to embody the, him in the work that I do, where it's not about indicting people. Right. It's not about pointing fingers. 
It's about invitation, right? right? To think differently, to be exposed to difference, to, to be able to value and respect each other, to, to, to come to the table and, and to break bread and to build relationships, right? Across communities and across sectors and across economics and across racial divides and across politics and all of these things. Right. Because at the end of the day, regardless of where you, you come from, regardless of your experiences, regardless of, of, of your economics, as the Bible says, we're still one, right? We're still one. I think about my, my favorite quote that, that Dr. King used. He said that if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, don't stop moving forward. Keep moving forward. Right? This work is hard. The work that I do in domestic violence is hard. The, the work of racial reconciliation is hard. Yeah. But we cannot afford to stop moving forward. It's vital that we do so, and I try to embody that in everything I do. But I also have to keep in mind and remember that people hated Martin Luther King. Yeah. People hated Martin Luther King the way that they hated Jesus, mm -hmm. right? People assassinated Martin Luther King the way that they assassinated Jesus, right? And so in so doing this work, we have to dispel this notion that I'm, I'm, I'm only able to do this if other people get on board. I'm only able to do this if I'm affirmed by other people, if, if other people are able to follow me. No, that's not what this is about, right? That's, that's not what Jesus Christ was about, right? In order, to, in order for you to do this work, in a lot of ways, you have to deny yourself, right? And, 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 and that means denying the part of you that needs to be comfortable in order to do it, right? right? All of that is in remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King. All of that is in remembrance of our savior, Jesus Christ. Well, you talk in the book, or you tell a story about somebody who told you they were gonna be your ally and your, and your advocate and your friend, but then when push came to shove and they had the chance to, to really uh, stand up and help, um, they didn't. Uh, they they kind of turned on you, uh, let you down. Um, Woodmont is a predominantly white church, but we've been working really hard this past year to, to, to ask the hard questions of what can we do to help with racial reconciliation? What can we do to, 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 to build connections in the community? What would you say to that? How can we continue to make things better? I, you know, I know the first part of your first answer is relationships. That's why I've really enjoyed getting to know you and becoming your friend and hearing your perspective. But what would you say to those questions? Well, I think, as you mentioned, it is about relationship, but I'd also take it a little further and say that, you know, relating this back to our faith, right? Faith is not faith unless it's activated when it's tested. Being an ally, being a friend, the words mean nothing unless it's activated when tested, right? And so it's so important that we recognize moments where we can show that we're an ally, where we can show that we have faith, mm -hmm. right? Those moments, as I've explained in the book, come when it's really tested at the core. So the example in the book is one where a, a supervisor of mine who said she was an ally, who said she was on our side, who actually said that if something were to happen to me, that she would be the very person to step in front of me and take it on herself. But when an opportunity came for her to support instead of leading, that's when things changed. Immediately, things changed. And the only thing that changed from my working standpoint was that she was no longer my supervisor. She was no longer the person dictating what I did and when I did it and how I was compensated for it. Those were the things that changed. So it was a moment for her to show that she was indeed an ally, that her words actually had meaning behind them. Right. That's, that's what this racial reconciliation is about. That's, that's where we need to start in terms of making sure that we are actually, as the Bible says, one, right? And then taking it a step further from that, going to your point about relationships, we gotta break bread together. How, I was, I was uh, playing golf with a friend of mine who, who runs a bank and I asked him, I said, you know, how many friends do you have who are different than you 
who are beneath middle class. Friends who are different than you, who are beneath middle class. He said, I'm ashamed to say I don't have any. Mm -hmm. right. right? But this is the same individual who is extremely philanthropic in the community, serves on many boards who are making decisions and impacting people in marginalized communities who are below middle class. Right. When you, when you operate from the standpoint of charity, and that is the only experience you have with any group of people, it is impossible for you to see them as valuable. You only see them from the standpoint of them needing something from you. But what about what, about what you might need from them that we leave on the table because we haven't valued relationship. If we're gonna get better as a country, if we're gonna fix the tension, if we're gonna be, be better as a community, all the things that we do advocating are important. All the, all the charity that we do is important. How we vote is important. What's more important is that we build relationship. Final question for you. Um, you've, you've seen a lot in your life. You, you were a superstar when I first came to Nashville in uh, 2007. I guess it was right after that. I, I loved going to Memorial, watching you play. Uh, just unbelievable. Those were some fun years in Vandy basketball. You, you've been to the NBA. You've seen uh, success, fame, uh, money. Um, but what would you say at this point in your life, you know, everything that glitters is in gold, right? What are the things that, that matter most to you as a person? That matter, what are your priorities? What are your values? What are the things that you uh, want to focus on uh, right now? Uh, how would you answer that? Well, I think it's, it's three things. Number one, the most important thing to me is living out my faith, living out my relationship with Christ, that because of my relationship with Christ, I'm able to love others in a way that is impactful, influential, but most importantly, in a way that's vulnerable. Because out of our vulnerability oozes not only transformation, but it also oozes solutions. We're able to solve so many problems from a place of love, right? And our faith activates that. That's why when, when Jesus went to people's house to, kill, to, to um, heal their kids, he told everybody who had any level of fear, you got to get out. You got to get out. I, I, I can't do what I've been called to do in this moment because of the fear. I need people who are believing that no matter what change is going to happen, that all things are possible with Christ. Right. That, that, like, that has to that has to be first and foremost. Secondly, it's relationship. The thing that I'm, I'm investing in the most are my relationships, not just with people in my family and people in the community who look like me. We're going on double dates, my wife and I, with, with people and families who don't look like me, who have had vastly different experiences than, than I have, and truly building relationship where they call me family and I call them the same, right? I'm committed to this because that's how we fix the heart of these issues. And then lastly, I'm also committed to education. We, we, we have to do the work of educating ourselves on the truth of issues. There, there, there's, there's a book by um, Ibram Kendi called Stamped from the Beginning that talks about the history of racial tensions in our country, where it started, where those ideas come from how it was indoctrinated into lessons being taught in school in terms of our history, right? And it feeds back into Dr. Martin Luther King's message and, and so many others in the civil rights movement and feeds into the, what's happening now and how we fix the issue. We can't, we can't fix something that we're, we're resistant to really educating ourselves on the history of what happened and why? 
And it will, if we do the work of educating ourselves, it will answer the question, how would you respond if it was confirmed that the way in which you think and believe was actually wrong? You've got to be committed to the education in order to answer that question. So living out your faith, building relationships, and being committed to education because that's how we learn, that's how we change. That's how we change. Shane, thank you. I'm gonna close, uh, close us in prayer, if that's okay. Loving God, thank you for, uh, for my friend Shane Foster. Thank you for his journey that he's willing to share, for his commitment to this community, to addressing domestic violence, to helping uh, with racial reconciliation. Thank you for the lessons that he shared with us today. Um, I pray for him as he continues to travel and speak and also as he continues to work right here in the Nashville community and uh, may his words this morning inspire us to do better, to be better. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.
Sisters and brothers in Christ, would you please bow your heads and join your hearts with mine in a word of prayer. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gift that you've given us, the gift of being able to call you Father, the gift of relationship with you. You have created us and claimed us as your own. You've brought us into the family of God and given us a place in your heart and home that can never, ever be taken away from us. We are yours and you are ours, our merciful, loving, heavenly Father. And as a parent is so attentive to the cries of his or her children, you are attentive to our cries as well. And today we cry out for all of those in our congregation who are hurting. We pray for those who are sick with the coronavirus, for those who are sick with cancer, for those who are sick with any other type of illness or disease. We pray for those who are lonely, for those who are isolated, for those who feel far off from the fellowship of believers. We pray, O oh God, that you would meet our needs, that you would be with us and take care of us, provide for us over and above what we could ask or imagine. Remind us all that you are near, that you love us, that you are for us. Yes, that you even died for us. Help us to know these things and to be comforted. Lord, we turn our hearts and our minds uh, to the world outside of us, to the world outside of these four walls, to the world outside of the body of Christ. And we see a world that is hurting, a world that is full of strife and greed and division. And we pray, O oh God, that you would work a miracle that you would do something, that you would act to turn things around, to make things better, to make things well. And we pray, oh God, that the church would be a part of it. We pray, oh God, that we ourselves would be a part of the solution and not the problem. Lord, give us the Holy Spirit in ever increasing measure to indwell us, to change us, to transform us, to animate us, to guide our words, our deeds, our actions, our decisions, our everything, so that our witness to the outside world would be faithful and true. May it be so, for we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Growing up, I listened to a lot of Christian music. It wasn't that uh, my family forbid me from listening to secular music. It's just uh, it was strongly encouraged that I listen to Christian music. And there's pros and cons to that. But growing up, um, a song came to me recently, and I'm not even entirely sure why, by a band called Third Day. And it was one that I listened to a lot when I was in high school. And the chorus went, all I want is love. I confess to this. I will take it, Lord, all you have to give. And that was just a really resonant song and prayer for me as a socially awkward teenager because all I did want was God's love and that I would take any amount of God's love that I could receive. And I think I thought about this again recently because I think that God could say or sing the same thing to us, remove the Lord part, but God could look to us and say, all I want is love, I confess to this. I will take it, all you have to give. Because what we're told in scripture over and over again is that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors, we love ourselves. And so all that we're asked to give is our love. And you can give your love in a lot of different ways. You can give your love through 
your tithes and offerings that support this church. You can give your love by volunteering for the Nashville Food Project with Fall Hamilton and working giving love for justice. You can give your love by calling your neighbor or checking in on someone in these really stressful and concerning times. You can give your love in that way and you can give your love obviously through your worship to God. And so as we have this time of offering this week, my encouragement to you is to think of all the ways in which you can give your love because God wants that. God wants to receive your love and know that as you give your love in whatever amount you can give, because sometimes the well seems dry, but as you give your love, know that also God will give love to you in ways that you cannot imagine, 10 and 100 and 1,000 fold. Let us pray. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for showing us your kindness and your compassion and your mercy. And God, I pray that you would stir our hearts to give to you and to our neighbor and to our community in every way that we can out of love. Not out of obligation, not because we have to, but because that love animates us. It makes this world beautiful. It makes this world good. It makes this world just. God, all we want is your love, and we confess to this. We will take it, Lord, all you have to give. And give us the strength and the courage and the imagination to give as well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to the table. So an author that I really admire um, once said, love is the protagonist of God's story. And I love that, especially after the turmoil over the last week, where most of us are wondering what is up and what is down? What can we believe in? What is true? Love is the protagonist of God's story. So tomorrow we're going to celebrate um, a saint, Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, we must rediscover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. Love is the only way. So we have to really be grateful that God gave us the gift of Jesus. Because in moments like this where we're not quite sure who we can look to, we have Jesus to look to who reminds us what is right, what is true, what is the way. And that is love. So over 2,000 years ago, he set a table and he invited his friends, his disciples to come to this table, a table of love where they would be filled so that they could go back out in the world and be people of love and hope and joy and grace and healing in the world, which is what our world needs right now, each one of us. He took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Each time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us a breadcrumb trail of hope that leads us to you, leads us to this table where we can rediscover what truly matters, what is sacred, what is true, Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us a solid grounding, a center that would hold. We ask for your prayers and your grace and your blessings and your healing in our families, in our church, in our country, and in our world. God, we really need you to draw near. We need you to reveal your presence and your grace and to give us clarity and to give us hope, and to give us a way forward. Thank you for the gift of your Son, who taught us how we are to live in this world. We're to love one another. We're to be there for one another. We're to heal, and speak truth, and forgive, and show mercy, and be courageous, and believe that redemption is our inheritance, and is the way that the story will unfold for all of us. We love you, God, and we trust in you. Please continue to watch over us and protect us. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping uh, with us today. I want to thank Shane Foster uh, for being with us and for his words uh, of inspiration uh, and challenge. Um, starting next Sunday, we will offer uh, our two services starting uh, January 24th, a week from today, uh, 9.15 and 10.30. Uh, we will have our safety checks in place, uh, masks, uh, temperature checks, socially distant, and we will also continue to do the online service and live stream the 915. The chapel is very close to being done. Uh, once the chapel is done, uh, the plan is to have one service in the sanctuary, uh, one service in the chapel. And so we'll be communicating that in the weeks ahead. Uh, also this Wednesday night, Rubel Shelley and I will continue our class uh, that's on Christianity post-corona, and we're going to wrestle with some of the difficult theological questions that we all ask during this time, like, why would God allow a pandemic? Where is God in the pandemic? So join us Wednesday night, 630. Uh, that is on Zoom, and we'd love to have you join us for that. Let's prepare now for our benediction. Go forth now and live, leaving your worries, your fears, your troubles, and your sorrows behind, but take in their place faith and hope and love, for these are the gifts from Christ to all of you. Amen.